There was a great report that just came out, which talked about the asset that can beat uh, Bitcoin uh, by all three ways, all three measures, cumulative, annualized, and year-to-date. And it was pretty uh, interesting as this report came out, because when you take a look at, at Bitcoin and how things are doing in the crypto market itself, we've taken quite a beating. And the answer is to that question is nothing. So this was a great report put out by Charlie Leo. Uh, there's a link in the description. You can check him out on Twitter. Really good information as far as just, uh, just data that's been put out. And he said, look, here's uh, 2023 thus far has been uh, the complete opposite of 2022 with nearly every major asset class seeing gains, asset class returns since 2011. And it's just a, a normal Charlie Baleo type of uh, data graph of the different assets that are doing well over time, cumulative and annualized. And when I took a look at this, of course, Bitcoin is number one. And we can see that uh, this is from 2011, 2022, and then 23. And year to date thus far, just thus far, Bitcoin is up 85%. And then we've got the NASDAQ 100, AEF stocks, gold, US large caps, long duration treasuries, EM stocks, preferred stocks, invertible, high yield bonds, tips, uh, EM bonds, US small caps, US cash, uh, real estate investment trusts, or REITs and commodities. In all honesty, uh, everybody's getting their teeth kicked in by Bitcoin, which is okay, because I think if you're watching this channel, you may have uh, picked up a little bit of Bitcoin yourself. And it's interesting because people always say, well, don't cherry pick. And we're taking a look just like at this time frame because, you know, don't cherry pick all these different time frames because you have to be a little bit more honest. And that's true. And that's why I like Charlie because he says, well, look, here's what we got from 2011, 2023. Cumulative, cumulative of quite some time, of 12 years. You're up 10,192,975%. If you invested <laughs> since all the way back then, and Nasdaq 100, you'd be up 555 percent. Stocks, gold, so on and so forth, and that's just a, a very long time frame. But annualized year over year, how would you do? Because that's another data point. People are like, well, don't cherry pick. Well, here you go. Bitcoin itself, 155 percent annualized year over year. Yes, there's some down downturns, downtimes, but. As time goes on, dollar cost average, things tend to work out. Then we've got 16.5% uh, for the NASDAQ 100, which is still pretty good. I must admit, 16% year over year annualized returns, pretty fantastic. Almost 5% for EAFE stocks. Gold, 2.4%. Watch out. US large cap, 12.2%. I think uh, commodities down here, 7.3%. So this is just a nice little, little graph of of how things are going. And I, and I think when, when people talk about Bitcoin and the crypto market in general, they tend to focus on a lot of the negative, which of course is the most recent. And that's actually the same thing they do when things go up. So if you're able to, to zoom out, things are looking pretty good. And then also, the other thing that, that actually confused me was this, uh, asset classes in the world and how things are, are going. Because if we're if we're outperforming everything, well, how are we doing as far as like an asset class? If we take a look here, uh, this is from documenting Bitcoin. You've got gold, 13 trillion, Apple, 2.6, Microsoft, 2.1, Saudi Aramco, oil, silver, Alphabet or Google, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, NVIDIA, and then there's Bitcoin at $587 billion. And if we just blow that up, this is where they got that information from. We're actually right in front of Tesla as far as uh, market cap just by just barely. So again, when I take a look at, at the history of Bitcoin, and you can take a look at other things like, you know, you might want to take a look at Ethereum and how that's done over, over the years, annualized and cumulative. It just makes me wonder, I'm like, why is our market cap so incredibly low, yet we outperform essentially everything out there? So it's just an odd thing to take a look at. And then if we even blow that up into a bigger perspective, this is uh, an updated version of all the world's money and markets in one visualization. This is updated for 2022. I like this one because it shows uh, uh, Sam Bankman Fried here. Ah, times have changed. March 2022, Sam had 26 billion. Today he's got 1 billion, but I think it's all locked up. Uh, you got sports teams, 340 billion. Crypto, 
this was in 2022, 760 billion. This is before the high of 3 trillion, 3.1 trillion when we had back in the day. Military spending currency is 8 trillion. Gold, again, 11.5, 12 trillion, somewhere around there. World's billionaires, 12 trillion. Central bank balance sheets, 28 trillion. S&P 500, 36 trillion. And of course, when we're talking about S&P 500, global money supply, stock markets, just stock markets in general. Larry Fink came out from BlackRock and talks about tokenized, tokenization of assets will be the next big thing. And if he's talking about that, tokenization of, of stocks, I mean, look how much we have here. I mean, you've got, what do we have here? S&P 500 is $36 trillion. Global stock market is over $100 trillion. Not too bad. Global debt, $300 trillion. Global real estate, if we can tokenize some of that, $259 trillion. Wow. Agriculture, household wealth, 500 trillion. Then derivatives, which we think is somewhere around $600 trillion. Just think of the possibilities here. So again, I just have to ask the question, why is our market cap? What is our market cap actually? I'm curious here. The entire market cap of crypto is 1.34 trillion, but Bitcoin itself market cap is 587 billion. It just boggles the mind how things do that. But that is what we have. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I think we're in the right place at the right time, but uh, hey, I've been wrong before. Also, on top of this, here's some, I don't know how you're going to take this. Might be good news, might be bad for some people. Celsius. There was a great video of Alex Mashinsky just walking around uh, NYC NFT event like nothing was going on. Of course, he had a security detail. Follow me on Twitter. Or check it on Twitter. It's very, it's quite disturbing. However, uh, Nova Wolf, the company where they, uh, Celsius, and their lawyer and their legal team, which you're paying for, we're paying for actually. <laughs> Uh, they're planning to tokenize equity of Celsius's new firm with $2 billion in assets. That's our assets. So this is what's going on. And before I get into it, I will say this. At least things are moving in the right direction. I mean, this isn't what we want it to be. I personally thought that we should have gotten all of our crypto back and just washed our hands of it. But unfortunately, the powers that be in Celsius said, no, no, we want to uh, create a new co because we know what we're doing and we want to sell it off. And this new company, Nova Wolf, says, yeah, we, we know what we can do. And uh, sure, I, I don't believe them, but whatever. This is what's going on. Nova Wolf will manage the new company for five years, which will have a new name and a new board of directors. Will be traded through a fairly untested method of tokenizing assets on the blockchain. Again, what Larry Fink was talking about. Board of directors are chosen by Nova Wolf, an official committee of creditors, which represents their interests. Uh, the plan could take effect as soon as June 30th. Wow, going pretty fast. And this is what's interesting. Nova Wolf has uh, committed $45 million in the transaction, but our assets could be worth as much as $2 billion. That's a pretty good deal. Uh, if I could put in $45 million and get $2 billion in assets, I might do it myself. Uh, the assets in question include Celsius's mining units, which have been vastly unprofitable for the longest time. It's loan portfolio, state crypto, and other total investments, according to court fillings. And this is from the Nova Wolf co-founder and managing partner, Jason New says, what I'm really most excited about is the flexibility to be in a position to play offense. When you have an entire industry that's playing defense, given that major crypto firms are either in bankruptcy or facing regulatory scrutiny, and that would have been Celsius themselves. So this is what's going on. This is going to be a tokenized equity. A uh, new company will trade it on on-chain and outside of stock exchange. It will have, however, be under the SEC disclosure rules, which I have no problems with that. Look, if the SEC says, you know what, you need to disclose the information that's going on, without the SEC and the public accountability for Voyager, I never would have known that they made the most, the dumbest, the dumbest loan in existence that I can think of. They loaned $640 million to Three Arrows Capital, uncollateralized. If that document wouldn't have been put out, we never would have known. Never would have made that video two weeks before everything went kaput. So if SEC has to say, you know, we have to disclose this information, so much the better. See, sometimes regulatory oversight isn't that bad. Sometimes it is okay. Anyhow, 
equity tokens will be sold on the Providence blockchain. Has anybody heard of that? Me neither. General earned creditors with claims below 5,000 will see 70% recovery of their claims, liquidity cryptos. Let me say that again because you're going to have questions. General earned creditors, which is most of us, you put it in a, into Celsius, you wanted to earn because we got ahead of ourselves. And if you had less than $5,000, you're going to see 70% recovery. Up to 100% of the rest of the assets, which is the vast majority of people who have over $5,000 in earn, minus what is needed to run the new company, will be dispersed to earn creditors with claims over 5,000. So what's gonna happen is, if you are an earn 5,000 or less, you're gonna get 70% recovery. If you have it more than that, you're gonna get this new co in this shiny new package of tokenized assets, which is gonna be, chain, which is gonna be traded on this thing called the Providence blockchain, which never heard of in my life. Here's what Providence blockchain is. So I had to take a look, a peek of what the heck this is. So Providence blockchain is purpose built to transform financial services. You can tokenize and build and validate, and that's adorable. My question is this, is it centralized or not? You can say you're a blockchain and have two validators and go, we're decentralized. So you gotta scroll down here, link in the description. And where it says become a validator, start validating. You can click on that and the commissions and voting and gas prices directly on Providence blockchain. Here's where it gets into it. So Providence, you see Osmosis? Osmosis is an open source DeFi platform based on IBC or inner blockchain communication developed in the Cosmos network. And if we come over here and we can just see, actually, hold on. It says right here, purchase. If I click on that, it's gonna take me to, here's Osmosis info.osmosis.zone. Here's the token called hash. And here's the volume in 24 hours. Zippo, here's the price of it, two cents. Market cap, nothing. Liquidity, a whopping 1,543. That's what this is gonna be built on. And then also, for more news, uh, welcome to Providence Blockchain Documentation. It's our open source software is built on the robust foundation of two powerful tech, Cosmos, SDK, and Tendermint blockchain applications platform. So when you take a look at the different things about, you know, what is Providence blockchain, what it really is, you really got to think of yourself, always think to yourself this. What is this being built on? What is the foundation? Because there's going to be a ton of different things that are going to come out, but you really want to think to yourself, what is this built on? That's why everybody's so big on Ethereum. Because I know some people hate Ethereum. They're like, wow, Ethereum sucks and, and it has all these gas fees. And that's true. You got a point. I'm not a big fan of it, but eh, a lot of things are being built on it. A lot of things being built on that, on Avalanche, on Cardano, on, Co on Tendermint and SDK and, and Osmosis or Cosmos. So when you take a look at these projects and you're trying to figure out well, which one do I really get into, I'm not going to give you financial advice, but really take a hard look at what everything is built on and kind of go from there. Again, when the gold miners moved out west and they were looking, they were panhandling for gold, who got rich? Was the people that were in the individual mines mining for gold and, and making their fortune? No, it was the picks and shovels, the people that sold them that. Everything was built on that. That was the backbone of the organization. And that's how people got rich, just by supplying on the backbone of hard labor and work. So let me know what you think about that in the, con in the contents, in the comment section. I'm not a big fan of this Nova Wolf, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. And then lastly, just to finish up, and then we'll get into a little chat action. Uh, this piece. I found this quite interesting. Not to be able to talk about it. Hyper casual Goliath Voodoo launching its own blockchain ecosystem in crypto. Now stay with me on this one. I know people aren't big gamers on my channel. I get it. I'm not a big gamer either. But we really have to take a pay attention to this, this sector. So approximately 10 blockchain games are currently in development, expected to launch in Q3. That's coming up. We're looking at July, August, September, right? Okay. It's going to be Voodoo Coin. I'm not telling you to go out there and buy it. I'm just saying, just stick with me. Publisher ex is expecting to rely primarily on a Discord community that has yet to be built, but is planned to be ready by summer 2023. There will be an advantage to being part of this community because those who test the games in advance will be able to earn tokens in a privileged way. Interesting. Probably not in America, but who knows. This is the crux of it. Across the company's library of apps and games, 
Voodoo had surpassed 6 billion downloads. 6 billion downloads. 1 billion of these were achieved within the nine months previous. So you might be asking yourself, well, that's interesting, 6 billion downloads, and they want to get into crypto. That sounds pretty good. I bet they're really awesome games, aren't they? No, they're dumb. They're not dumb, they're just goofy. They're casual games. This is Voodoo Games. This is from the Google Store. You can see these games are not AAA ranked games, yet 6 billion downloads. Why? It's because there's a lot more casual gamers out there globally than there is anything else. When you're on a flight, I was just on a flight right now. I just flew in from LA. And what I do, I just, well, my phone is, I can't get on the internet. So I just play these goofy little games that I've downloaded along the way. Just casual, stupid games. These are dumb. Look at this. Look at this. What's the point, Rob? The point is this. There's a great report, Statista. Uh, and it talks about what gaming is. How many gamers are out there? This is from 2023. How many gamers are there? Globally, there are approximately 3.09 billion active video game players. Just so you know, there's roughly around 7 or 8 billion people in the world. Roughly half play games on their, on their phone. Most of those are casual. Asia is home to almost 1.5 billion gamers. That's why we don't hear too much about it, because here in the U.S. Also, because my channel's a little bit older, and they skew older, and they don't play as many games. Just look at this. 2015, there was 2.03 billion number of gamers. Now there's 3.0. 22 billion, not bad. Esports, games by region, far away Asia. Then comes Europe, Latin America, and running up the pack is North America. Also, the last thing, proportion. Statistically, my channel is between ages 35 to 44. Proportion of these are 14% of the number of gamers out there. You're not the target. 38% under 1820. Then you got 12 and 9 and 7. The majority are people younger than us, which is how it is. And then lastly, the most popular video, game, video games out there are casual games with 63% of people claiming to play these regularly. Casual games, action, shooter, triple-A right game, racing, family. Ooh, family games, adventure games. What does this mean? Look at the games that are being built right now and what they're being built on. There are a lot of games right now I know people hate Ethereum, or some people like Ethereum. There are a lot of games being built on by Polygon right now. There are a lot of games uh, on Cosmos. There are a lot of games being built on the different chains that you maybe are not interested in, but look at the utility of what is being used, especially with gaming. And that, my friends, I think is the bigger play at large, but I could be wrong. Anyhow. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And that is it for the news today. So again, I think that uh, <laughs> even though that uh, our market, our market cap is uh, only 1.2, 1.3 trillion. I think uh, like we just took, talked about, Bitcoin outshines most things. So I think we got a lot of room to run. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have a recession. The Fed seems to think we're going to have a soft recession in Q3, Q4. We talked about this. I think that uh, the long-term play is the best play for me. I don't know what it is for you. But if we're looking at the four-year cycles, everything lines up 2025. And that's it. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I don't think you should be uh, in just investing and setting and forget it. You should probably try to get as much information as you possibly can. And that means doing a lot of research. So why not? That's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it.